There are a slew of wireless in-ear monitor systems on the market right now, especially in the two to $300 range. Today, we're going to do a deep dive in the $210 Phoenix Pro PTM10 wireless in-ear system. What is up everyone, Man Bun Mellet here. Instead of a long boring intro on why I'm reviewing this system, I'm just gonna tell you to like and subscribe. Now let's get into it. The PTM10 is a system from Phoenix Pro spelled P-H-E-N-Y-X. On Amazon, the system goes for $210 for one transmitter and one receiver or $340 for one transmitter and three receivers. See my link below. For $210, what does this system offer? Here's what they tell you. It's an analog UHF or ultra high frequency radio system. This is more of a traditional wireless system compared to a digital system. There are 89 selectable frequencies. It has stereo and mono modes, selectable in both the transmitter and receiver. What's nice about having a stereo signal is you can have separate signals in each ear. I prefer to have my guitar and vocals in my right ear and everything else in my left ear. The rated range is 164 feet or 50 meters for everyone outside the US. The frequency response is 60 Hertz to 16 kilohertz, kinda, and the battery life on the receiver will last at least eight hours. In the box, you'll get a plastic carry case. In that case is the transmitter, receiver pack, antenna, headphones with three sets of interchangeable ear tips, AC adapter for the transmitter, a set of AA batteries for the receiver, a quarter inch TRS to eighth inch TRS adapter, three plastic plugs, seven screws, and a rack mount kit, which includes rack ears, antenna extension cable, and antenna panel adapter. First of all, I have no idea what the plastic plugs or extra screws are for, so we'll forget about those. The included headphones are meh. Honestly, for $210, I'm surprised they included any headphones at all. They have no sound isolation, which makes them pretty useless in my opinion. You should probably throw those away and get a set of Shure SE215s. Trust me, they're worth it. The receiver pack has a plastic body measuring 3.5 inches by 2.5 inches by one inch and weighs about three and a half ounces without batteries and five and a half ounces with batteries. On the top of the receiver is a volume control, power button, antenna, and headphone output. On the front is the LCD display, infrared sensor, two control buttons, connection LED, and battery compartment. On the back is the metal belt clip. It takes two AA batteries. The plastic body feels pretty solid in the hand. When you shake the pack, you can hear a plastic rattle, which is mostly the power button and a little bit from the battery compartment door. Nothing really to worry about. The metal clip is strong and the two little bosses on each side of the clip prevent it from popping out. I was a little worried about it having a plastic body, so I figured I'd do some drop tests. Of course, I only did this test because I have an extra receiver. I dropped it from waist height, roughly 42 inches for me, since that's the most likely height it would fall. I first dropped it on a medium thickness rug covering concrete. It bounced off completely unscathed. I then tried dropping it on a piece of plywood, same result. The plywood took more damage than the receiver. Then to the worst case scenario, concrete. Again, it bounced right off. The corner it landed on got pretty scuffed up, but handled it just fine. For my last test, I dropped it on concrete from about six feet. This time the receiver bounced, but lost one of the locking tabs on the battery door, causing it to open and the batteries to fall out, but it still worked. I think I can safely say that this receiver can handle being dropped. Although you shouldn't drop it. Turn it on, you'll quickly see the current group and channel, then what frequency it is set to. Below that you have RF or signal strength, the AF or audio input level, and the battery level. When there's no input to the receiver for 10 seconds, the display will turn off. Quickly pressing the power button will turn the display back on, or you can press either of the control buttons to access the receiver features. They can be used to change the left right balance by quickly pressing either button. The LCD will say BAL. From there, you can adjust to the left or right. After not pressing either button for about a second or so, it'll go back to showing the frequency, then turn off the display. To access the other features, hold down the set button. There you have EQ, which will give you a high frequency boost. I'll show you exactly what that does in the testing. Hit the add button to turn the feature on or off. Hit the set button to go to the next feature. LI is the limiter. It is supposed to do what it says. Honestly, I haven't noticed any difference in the audio, but it's there. Next is FO or mono. Turning this on will turn the headphone output to mono, summing both left and right channels. Lastly is LO or lock. Should be pretty obvious, but it locks the receiver from changing any settings. It will also prevent the frequency from being changed as well. How do you change the frequency? Well, you do that with the transmitter, so let's get into that guy. The body is metal and measures one and three quarter inches tall by seven and seven eighths wide by one and three quarters deep. On the front, you have the power button, infrared transmitter, control buttons, display, wireless volume output, headphone volume, and headphone output. On the back, there's the power input, power cable strain relief, left and right combo XLR quarter inch TRS inputs, negative 12 dB pad, and antenna connector. When you turn the transmitter on, you'll see the audio level output, set frequency, and whether it is in stereo or mono mode. If you press the set button once, 
The infrared light turns on and the display seems to go a little crazy until it displays end. This is how you set the frequency on the receiver. Make sure the receiver is on, not locked, and facing the transmitter. The receiver will display the group and channel it changed to, and then the frequency. If the receiver is already on the transmitter frequency, nothing will happen. The maximum range I was able to get the frequency change to work was about six feet, but it was hit or miss. It works really well within four feet. Hitting the set button twice gives you access to the other features. You can change the group and channel, which changes the frequency, switch between stereo and mono modes. The mono mode only uses the right input and a locked transmitter, which prevents any changes to the channel, group, or mode. If you go to exit and hit either up or down, you go back to the standard display, or if you hit set again, it'll run the frequency sync routine. Overall, pretty simple. One thing I don't like about the transmitter is if you use a power strip to cycle the power, it will not turn back on until you hit the power button. I would prefer it to turn on automatically once it receives power. Not a huge deal, but if it's mounted in a rack, it would be nice. Speaking of mounting this in a rack, the rack mount hardware is really easy to install. Remove the two screws on either side of the unit, Install a wing on either side using the same screws. Install the antenna, panel adapter, antenna, and extension cable. Depending on where you mount it or what gear is below it, you might want to remove the feet on the bottom. You can either grab them and use brute force or take a small screwdriver, pry it up and pull out the middle pin, then pull out the foot. What's nice about the rack kit is you can install it on either side. Overall, using the transmitter and receiver is straightforward. There's not a whole lot to complain about. All right, let's get into testing the system. I'll be testing the range, battery life, delay time, coloration and tone, and left-right separation. Check the time bar below to skip around if you want. First up, the range. They claim 164 feet or 50 meters unobstructed range, and I would say this holds up. I was able to walk all around my house without having any issues. I was even able to walk outside roughly 150 to 160 feet away before I started to have any signal issues, even with the transmitter being in my basement. For battery life, they claim at least eight hours with original batteries. I put a set of freshly charged 2400 milliamp hour rechargeable batteries in the receiver, connected my SE215s and pumped some pink noise through the transmitter. It took 10 hours and 23 minutes for the receiver to die. That's way longer than I would have predicted. I haven't tested alkaline batteries because you really should be using rechargeable batteries for any wireless pack. They'll end up costing you less money than normal batteries. Next, we'll look at delay time. Since this is a UHF system, this probably doesn't even need to be considered because it is really zero. The only reason I bring it up is because that is not the case for digital systems. However, the ones I've used aren't bad. Now the test is probably the most important is the coloration and tone, kinda. In my opinion, if an in-ear system colors the signal or affects the tone a little bit, it's not that big of a deal. You're the only one hearing it, not the audience, so no big deal. If it's so bad that you can't hear yourself, then yeah, you need to worry about it. Looking at the frequency spectrum analysis, there's a roll off on the low end ending around 300 Hertz and a steep high end drop off starting at 12 kilohertz. You can also see a slight upward slope from 600 Hertz to three kilohertz. Listening to some music with my SE215s, the roll off on the low end is definitely there, but isn't too bad as there's only about two decibels drop at 60 Hertz. The high end cut doesn't affect the signal too bad either, but you lose some of that airiness, which isn't that bad of a loss for an in-ear system. I do hear a small bump in the highs, which is probably due to that slope in the middle and the drop off in the lows. I'd say while the coloration and sound quality aren't perfect, they're not bad at all, especially for the price of this system. Another thing we can look at is the EQ setting on the receiver. Turning it on gives you a significant bump at about 12.7 kilohertz. For me, this is completely unnecessary. However, if you don't have sound isolating earphones, which you should, turning this feature on might help the output from the receiver stand out from the outside noise. But really, get a set of isolating in-ears. They're absolutely worth it. The last thing we'll test is the left-right stereo separation. In a perfectly separated system, you'll only hear the left channel in the left ear and the right channel in the right ear. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, this isn't the case for the PTM-10. The separation is about 20 decibels, meaning when I send a signal to the left channel, it was present in the right channel, but 20 decibels lower than the left channel. When listening to a stereo signal, it's hard to hear that channel bleed over. What's interesting though, is I think I prefer the bleed over as opposed to completely separate. As I mentioned before, I put my guitar and vocal in my right ear and everything else in my left. When I plugged directly into the headphone output on the transmitter, there was complete separation and I didn't like it. The two channels were disconnected. Having the bleed over helps with keeping each of them feeling more connected. Now, all of these tests are great, but how does it work in the real world? Unfortunately, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, so no gigs, but I have been able to use the system at home practicing and during a couple band rehearsals. I have to say, it really holds up. I've had no issues with range, but the range is greater than my guitar wireless system, so I'm pretty much limited to that. Having a stereo signal has been a game changer. I've only used mono systems prior to this, and it's great having myself in one ear and everyone else in the other. 
I can easily tell when I chunk a note. Because it's a radio system, I've gotten some very minor interferences from time to time, a slow ticking that lasts a few seconds, usually from a cell phone too close, or a quick whirring sound, probably from being too close to some other electronics. But nothing that ever prevented me from hearing the signal. The biggest issue I've had seems to have been corrected. Let me explain. During a rehearsal, the receiver output a pretty solid distortion sound, preventing me from hearing the signal. After turning the volume down slightly, the distortion went away, but about five minutes later, the batteries died. I asked my contact at Phoenix Pro about this, and they said that this is a known issue that occurs when the batteries are getting low, but has been corrected on newer units, so I really wouldn't worry about it. Plus, you should be changing those batteries out sooner anyway. Well, there you go. Everything you need to know about the Phoenix Pro PTM10 wireless in-ear monitor system. Hopefully this video helped you out. If it did, hit that like button down there below, really helps me out a lot. And if you wanna see more of my videos, make sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're notified whenever I release a new video. But hey, until next time, rock on.